Okay, Miles Wally Albright. Mm, 111. 2021. 20, Bible in a bar. Hobbs Island Road, Huntsville, Alabama. Honored to be here. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we bless you and we praise you and we trust you and we entrust ourselves to you tonight. Dad, you know how much I am depending on you. Tonight. Help, Lord. Help me to teach and let the anointing to teach and to become teachers be on these people and on these people that hear this in the future by recording. <clears throat> and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I, <laughs> Alabama. Uh, I am just particularly honored to be teaching on the night of the national championship <laughs> for college football when Alabama is playing. I'm, uh, you guys are kind of fanatics, you know. I want to get really, be really serious about this Jesus thing. I mean, you're going to show up on the night of the national championship? You know, in about five minutes out there, the traffic will stop, if you'll notice, you know. Well, yeah, you can walk down the middle of the parkway. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, be done by halftime. But uh, you know, I've always noticed. I've worked outside a lot of my life, and and especially during the Auburn Alabama game, it was just you could tell there was no traffic. You wouldn't even notice being out in the country. You wouldn't really think about traffic noise, but still, there's a, a certain amount of distant traffic noise even in the country but it stops during the auburn alabama game <laughs> anyway anyway well i'm really really happy to be here tonight a couple of things about tonight um it doesn't have to be that this way but of late i have been get, get bringing on these monday night meetings New, you know, the next level of understanding that I'd gained in the previous week, and that's the case again tonight. Um, I saw some things this week that I did, hadn't seen before, and so I'll be bringing them, but a couple of things. Number one, without knowing the story of the mystery of Benjamin's evening, what I'm, what I'm going to share tonight, it's really going to be kind of, huh? You know, where is that going? What is that about? And all y'all are pretty familiar with the mystery of Benjamin's evening. Uh, and so and I, it, it actually would be a good three hours teaching uh, to, to, to back up and give it all. It certainly would. But we can't do that tonight and don't want to do that tonight. But just uh, for the sake of the fact that there's people out there, you know, probably on Zoom right now live, and certainly will be people watching, you know, for the next millennium or whatever. Um, let me give tonight's word some context and back up and give you just a thumbnail sketch of the mystery of Benjamin's evening again. And... Um, because what I'm, it's just like the Lord with me is just staying on this Benjamin saga. It's almost like I'm to the point where it's almost like Benjamin is almost the central character in Genesis. And I've never thought that before. But it's, uh, it, it's awesome what's going on with Benjamin building towards the end of the book of Genesis. And then going on through the scriptures, or out on into the words of Jesus. Um, 
<laughs> uh, all of a sudden, my eyes cleared, and I looked, and I saw this. <laughs> what? There's a sign over there that says, friends show up on game day. Well, friends, I think that was put up there for tonight, Pat. I don't know how long that sign's been there. But you guys are showing up on the game day or the game night, the national championship. I can't believe that's there. Anyway, uh, yeah, well, I'm honored to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell you what, if you show up during the national championship to hear an obscure word uh, tying the Old and New Testaments together, then you're pretty, pretty solid friends. So tip my hat to you. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, the mystery of Benjamin's evening was a teaching that, gave, that the Lord gave us the basic concept in October of 2018. And um, hey, I hope I didn't turn anything off there. I feel like a gunslinger. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was an awesome thing and it really grew out of the book of judges, um, which I think is a potent lesson for today. The book of judges is about the descending further and further into corruption of Israel for a 410 year period. And with each judge after the revival of each judge, they went a little further and, Okay, and then the last judge, Samson, was a uh, heterosexual sexual pervert, and um, and he he carried them low or and lower. Okay, uh, uh, um, all right. So anyway, so but then they went into the ultimate descent of in the nineteenth uh, chapter. There's 21 chapters in Judges of homosexual gang rape uh, happened there in the Bible, and um, as a consequence of that, uh, there was a war. A tribe was almost abolished, almost wiped out, blotted out. The tribe was Benjamin. Um, Benjamin was brought back from the edge of extinction. They were down to 600 men with no women, and they were brought back from the edge. Because uh, the, the other tribes had vowed never to give a bride to a Benjamite, and um, <clears throat> so anyway, six hundred women were obtained for these six hundred men, and that's quite a story, a very prophetic story. But in that resolution, the Lord was showing us that no Benjamin, no King Saul. No Benjamin, no Saul of Tarsus. No Benjamin, no Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, to save the church from the ultimate enemy of the church was Phariseeism slash legalism slash trying to bring the church back under law. And... It was an incredible thing um, when the Lord showed us that, that this last chapter of, of Judges was so profound. And then he began to speak to us about the Apostle Paul. And um, he showed us Paul is, you know, the Benjamite. We don't have definite defined tribes for the other apostles, we presume that most of them were from Judah. Jesus, we know, is from Judah. But a couple of times, Paul mentions the fact that he's a Benjamite. And, of course, that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, that he had gone to school under Gamaliel. He would have been a doctoral student. But he was from the tribe of Benjamin that was almost wiped out. But Benjamin was the 12th son of Jacob. His tribe was always a little different, usually small. But uh, when Jacob goes to die, that's Benjamin's father. In the next to last chapter of 
Genesis, he prophesies a very simple thing, one verse, about the tribe of Benjamin, and he says, well, the NIV says he's a raven, the Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, but the word is tarop, and I believe it means really a, a wolf in two pieces, torn in two pieces. In the morning, for, well, first piece is, in the morning he devours prey, in the evening he divides the plunder. Now, y'all, I'm not here to try to impress you, and I'm not, I'm not here to try to make you think that you have to learn Hebrew to, uh, to know anything. I am not, I promise. Uh, <clears throat> But and I'm but I, I do want to show you this for a specific reason. And sometimes to see past the English is uh really important. In Hebrew, Jacob said, in the morning he devours prey, but in the evening he divides the plunder. And the word for divide plunder is halak salal. Divide plunder. Salal is the word for um Plunder. It almost looks like salad, don't it? <laughs> but salal. Okay, that'll <coughs> that'll be <coughs> important after a while. <coughs> so if I, I'm gonna be kind of focusing on one Hebrew word in that, salal. And you'll see why I'm I'm doing that in, in a few minutes if you can stay with me. But anyway, then G, uh the the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. Now this is um, da, 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 1,300 years after Jacob's time, Isaiah is prophesying 1,300 years after Jacob and 700 years before Jesus, he's prophesying in uh, the in uh, Isaiah 53, the most, I mean, the crown jewel of the Old Testament, as far as I'm concerned. But that 12 verses, the 12th verse, the final verse is about, really it's about Paul. It's, a, well, it's about the resurrected Christ, and the Lord is speaking of the resurrected Christ, and the spirit of prophecy is saying that he will divide the plunder with the strong. And it's these two words again, halak salal, with the strong. <coughs> that this resur After the resurrection of this Christ, he will divide the plunder with the strong. And it's kind of a, hmm, strong. What's that about? Well, when the Lord showed us this, it was, it was one of the you know, grandest moments of my life because he showed us bang, 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 these three right here together because in Luke 11, 22, again, reviewing for you guys, um, in Luke eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus had been, had cast out a demon from a guy and the uh, Pharisees had said, well, yeah, the only way they could get around saying this is God is saying, no, this is the devil. You're casting out a devil by a devil. And the most famous verse for us is when Jesus says there, I believe in verse 17, he says, uh, <clears throat> any kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Abraham Lincoln used that in the Gettysburg Address. And um, so Jesus says that and really, he's talking about that the Pharisees don't know it, but they're fixing to be divided against themselves because he is going to call out one who he chose before he was born, Paul, who is at that point a ravenous, angry Pharisee persecuting the church. But the Lord knows he's going to call him out. And he says that, you know, that there is a strong man, speaking of demon, over Phariseeism, over legalism. And he calls it a strong man. And right now he says he don't have any problems. He's a strong man. He's fully armed. And he guards, guards his house. But he says one stronger than the strong man will divide the plunder. That's something to, that's profound. Because he's, he's prophesying that one of the Pharisees, the house will be divided. Paul will come out and he will be strong, stronger than the strong man and he will divide the plunder, and he is quoting Isaiah, who is quoting Jacob. And it's a, it's a triple-decker decker sandwich. It's, it's awesome. Especially, you know, you, you, you got the Son of God in red letters prophesying in, in Luke eleven twenty two. 22. 
Now, there's a lot more to that. In Luke 11, I've been trying for a month to go back and cover Luke 11 in a new way. It's an awesome chapter. Uh, but the Lord keeps giving me a little bit more to build onto this story. And I'm, I'm a little bit compulsive. I would really only be satisfied if I could teach this and teach all of it at one time <laughs> and not leave any of it un, unsaid and undone which is, you know, even Jesus said, I have more to say to you than you can now bear. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you couldn't bear that, certainly in one session, but what I want to go to tonight is what the Lord is uh, showing me. He's shown me, had two different days that the Lord showed me some new things, and I've really been before the Lord about them. And um, and, and maybe, let me write this over here while, I, while I'm over here. Does anybody recognize the term? There's a man's name. It's kind of a four-word name. Uh, actually, it's a, baby, a boy's name in the Bible. <laughs> this would be one of those trivia Bible trivia questions. Uh, Mac, if you want to win, if you... <laughs> When at Bible trivia, know that one. Just get on Jeopardy if you know that one. You'll be the only one who does. But there's a guy named Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't did you notice Salal? But anyway, we're going, we'll be getting there in a few minutes. Uh, but I want to go back to Judges chapter 21, where it's just where all this sprang from. And uh throw it out to you again. As we uh, as we come to that, you know, we actually I was in a Sunday school class and the teacher was just reading a chapter a week, going through Judges, and we got to this twenty first chapter, the last chapter, and it's a men's class, and the men walked out. I remember the mood when we walked out of that class, finishing that book. Everybody was bummed out. They were going, "Look, I got daughters. <laughs> I don't like the way this turned out." You know. These guys grabbed up and carried 200 women off and, and, and kidnapped them and made them their wives. What's up with this? <laughs> but anyway, it was, I, I, I sat down before the Lord and he began to open it. At that low moment, it, uh, it, it started to open for me. And uh, it's just like the Lord to show up in a moment like that. <clears throat> it, was awesome, it was awesome. But... Um, what I want to go back to here is this story they get, they say, oh no, we've gotten overdone this thing. There's 600 men that have survived. There's no women. And we've sworn we won't give a, any of our daughters to a Benjamite. So what they did was they, the war ain't over until you take care of all the business. And they look around and it was a death sentence if, you, if no city joined in the war. You had to go to war with Israel. You had to be united in war and, and uh, worship. And you had to show up or it was a death sentence. So they, they went to J, against Jabesh Gilead. It's a Jewish city. And they wiped them all out except for 400 women, for, uh, virgins, from uh, Jabesh Gilead. And they gave these 400 to the 600 Benjamites. And of course, they were 200 short. And so they, they're, they, they're saying something. They, uh, they make the comment uh, when they, they say, okay, we got to make arrangements for these other 200. While we're worshiping, the Benjamites, while we're worshiping at Shiloh, and it, it may have been tabernacles because they drank a lot of wine at tabernacles, and the girls are dancing at Shiloh. Run in there and grab you 200 and carry them off. And, and we'll talk to their fathers and their brothers and say, hey, we didn't get them brides during the war. And you didn't do this free will. You didn't give your daughter to a Benjamite. It was taken. So God won't hold it against us. So let, them, let it be this way. Kind of a bummer. But it's the Lord. It is the Lord. But the point is this. Halak Salal means divide the plunder. 
and what I, you know, James and John were called the sons of thunder. Well, guess what? Paul is the son of plunder. Okay. Uh, so Paul is the son of plunder. If the, his one of his great great grandmothers would have been the plunder of war. Now, y'all. So you go. Well, so what? I don't know. So what? But there is something behind that. Mark my words. That's Jehovah. That's the hand of the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. There's a message in that. He who divides the plunder, when Paul divided the plunder, he was the one, I probably should have told this earlier, but the plunder that Paul divided was he was the one who wrote and made it so clear that salvation is by grace through faith. He wrote Romans, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Thessalonians, he wrote Colossians. What could we do without Galatians? Etc. Uh, but he was the one who divided the plunder and brought salvation within reach and says it's not about works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. It is by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. He makes it so clear. And he had to fight the leadership of the church to keep them from going back to the law. In Galatians one and two along in there, he is confronting Peter, Barnabas, and the followers of James and says, no, it's salvation is by grace through faith. You're not going to require these people to be circumcised and keep the law, period. And that was, that was him dividing the plunder, defending the plunder, being a warrior. So he is a son of plunder. Now, someday the Lord will give me the rest of that or you, and you can tell me, but there's a, there's a profundity there. Second thing that I knew that I just understood, and this one, I will actually open the scripture and read to it. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. A lot of tonight is out of Isaiah. Isaiah is just always enchanted me. Uh, let's see. No, no. Isaiah 49 first. Yeah. Isaiah 49, and then we'll go to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 49, and then we'll go to 9. Um, uh, before I read, I really want to go read through 22 through 26, but before I read that, let me point out, and if I was going to do a comprehensive teaching on this, I would, you know, Paul, when he's finally sent out as an apostle with Barnabas in Acts 13, it is so profound that chapter he fulfills a lot of what he prophesied and wrote in Romans. Uh, for example, he strikes a Jew blind so that a Gentile can be saved. It's the first thing he does. And that's a picture of the, the Jews have received a hardening in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. I mean, there he is. And he takes his name, Paul, from the man, the Jew, the, the Gentile that got saved. But then he goes on and he preaches to, in synagogues, and, and the Gentiles more or less accept it, and the Jews more or less reject it. But um, he quotes, when they reject, when the Jews reject the gospel, he quotes Isaiah 49, and this is not really what I'm focusing on, but 49, 6, he quotes Paul in Acts 13 quotes. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. <coughs> That's the father speaking to the son. It ain't a big enough deal for you to save Israel. You're going to save the Gentiles. And there's that prophecy. And so Paul quotes that as a justification and to refute the angry Jews because they're going to the Gentiles. And thank God for that. I mean, that, oh Lord, I want to be in that number. Oh Lord, I am in that number. 
in case you're watching for the first time and you know this is Bible in a bar, this is actually 100% natural seltzer, calorie free, polar <laughs> something. It ain't beer. <laughs> it ain't beer. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> but where I'm going is this awesome chapter 49. Go to verse 22. And this is what the Lord is saying to me. There's, there's two of these verses in this passage right here that has, has always tantalized me. The Holy Spirit's always tantalized me with two of these verses in this passage. But let me read up and get up, up to it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. That's the goy. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Think about that. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. In other words, they will become like servants to you. In other words, the Gentiles are going to eagerly embrace the message coming from the Jews they will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Amen. Now, here are the two verses that have tantalized me for many years. And I'm just now coming to get, I'd say for 20 years, I've even taught, or close the service out of the, with these verses, leaving it unexplained before. <clears throat> because there's something so pregnant in verse 24 and verse 25 here. Can plunder, guess what? That's Salah. That's Salah. Y'all with me? Can plunder be taken? This is what the Lord says. Can plunder be taken from warriors or captives rescued from the fierce? But this, so it's a question. All right, y'all stop with me just a minute. F focus right here. We're going to go back and read, read it some more, but now focus here. What, what, what he's saying is, you're, you're saying, how could this ever be so? How could Gentiles ever come to Jews and say, Praise God, y'all got it. Y'all got the real God. Y'all got the real thing. I'm willing to kiss your feet, even Gentile kings and queens. How could that ever happen? How could that plunder, but he uses the word plunder, and captives. See, they're captives. The, the Gentiles were captives, without, as Paul said, without God and without hope in the world. <clears throat> and so they were captive, but the plunder of course, really is the gospel. They didn't know that then. Isaiah didn't know that. But it's the gospel of salvation by grace through faith that would go to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles, lots of them, millions of them, would say, hallelujah, I receive that. I can be saved because Jesus died for me and washed away my sins. All I have to do is accept him as my Lord. <clears throat> can plunder be taken from warriors or captives rescued from the fierce? The Lord asks. But this is what the Lord says. Yes! Captives, and he's going to see switches it around here. Captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children. I will save. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and they will be drunk with their own blood as with wine. And then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer. That's Gaal, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. <clears throat> but focus there on 25 and 26. What the Lord is saying, he's speaking a mystery. And, and I don't know, but I'm sure that, I'm sure this applies to this. I know this is about this. It's about the salvation of the Gentiles. It's about them coming and crying out, oh, God is really among you. How beautiful on the feet, uh, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. Paul quotes that in Romans, okay? 
the, the Gentiles cry out that you, that you are beautiful on the mountains. In other words, crossing the mountains and the valleys and the seas to carry the good news of the gospel. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring this gospel, the gospel of good, good news and good peace. And, and it's being brought to the Gentiles and the Gentiles, get this, are falling down and licking the dust at their feet. And these are Gentiles. I said again, these are Gentiles. What did Jesus say? to the apostles that they should do when they went to the Jewish cities. It's as in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He said, if they go to the Jewish cities and they reject you, what are you supposed to do? You know, for a living, I, I rake manure off my <laughs> boots every day. I was in mud up above my ankles today. Mud and manure, okay? I know what it is to shake. Luke says, wipe the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off your feet. And he's talking about when you go, he sends them out strictly to the Jewish cities. He says, when they reject you, and they're going to. He said, do not go to the Samaritans. Do not go to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Later, he sent them. In fact, he went with them to the Samaritans, right? Okay. <clears throat> and they were sent. It took them a while to get it. But they were sent to the Gentiles. But he said, go into Jewish cities, shake the dust off your feet. In other words, the, the apostles there declaring to the Jews the message, you're rejecting this. We, by our feet, were sanctifying this ground. We, by our, you know, we were, you, you, God says, I'll give you every piece of ground you put your feet on. We were sanctifying this ground. We were bringing good news. Our feet were beautiful. But you reject this. So we shake the dust off your feet. We go to the Gentiles, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to lick it up. That is the ultimate show of humble acceptance by the Gentiles, that they would fall down before a Jewish messenger or maybe a Gentile with a Jewish word, the word of the Messiah, whatever. The dust is licked up eagerly. I was doomed for eternal destruction, me and my house, but you've brought the good news and I fall down at your feet. I put my, it literally says my nose in the dirt. I'm so glad. That's how glad the Gentiles were. And there's a lot of difference in them and the, the Jews that stoned. Paul left him for dead. That's a lot of difference. That's a lot of difference. But that's what this is speaking of here is the salvation. Well, in, in this chapter in two places, the salvation of the Gentiles, but it mentions the plunder and the captives. The plunder is the salvation, the message of salvation by grace through faith that Paul was destined from by two prophecies that he, the Benjamite, would declare. He would divide the plunder. He shares it with the Gentiles. He got it from Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus. He said, I didn't get my gospel from man or through man, but I got it straight from the mouth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ obtained the plunder and divided it with the strong, divided it with Paul. There's a lot of people that read the New Testament and they say, well, this, this really, this, this is Paul's religion. This is a lucky thing Paul came along. He made Christianity what it is. Well, they're wrong, but they're right. <clears throat> but it wasn't just luck. It was destiny. It was destiny from eternity past, but specifically, it was destiny from 2,000 years before Paul, from what Jacob said and 700 years before Paul, what Isaiah said. <clears throat> and there's so much of this in Isaiah that he fulfilled in what he wrote, but also what he did, in, particularly in Acts 13, which I can't go into that tonight. But I wanted to say that because this, this, this term, this is not a very common word in the Old Testament, haloxala. All right, something else. So uh, one more thing, the final, my final main point tonight that's a new thing, or new to me, and I imagine it's new to you too, 
Go to Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7 is a short chapter, but it's one of the more famous, it has the most, one of the more famous verse, verses in it, a Christmas verse. A virgin shall conceive and be with child, and bear a son. You call his name Emmanuel. You know, that's quoted in the Gospels about the birth of Jesus. Jesus Christ, let me say this in case somebody misunderstands. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was born of a virgin. I mean, an absolute virgin. She had never been with a man. It couldn't be clearer and plainer in the New Testament. <clears throat> and out of that, um, Matthew says that, that, he, that, this, that this scripture is fulfilled. <clears throat> and really, it is fulfilled, but it's more than fulfilled. It's really filled full. Because when Isaiah says this, he means something kind of like this, but not exactly this, because Isaiah is talking about him, he and his wife having their second child. Okay? The word there can be used, that Isaiah used, can be used for a woman that was a virgin, never been with a man, or with a, for a young woman. But in New Testament, Jesus filled that full, and he was specifically born of a virgin that, that had never been with a man. It was a virgin birth. Jesus had a supernatural father. It was God. Okay, make that really, really clear. But this <clears throat> chapter, you really need to see more than just read it and go, well, I don't get that and just turn the page. <clears throat> okay, I, I talked from this yesterday some, and it's, it's a little tough because all the names of people, you know, Hebrew names and Hebrew places, kings and countries, and uh, it's a little hard to dis to describe. All right, uh, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, so Israel at the time of Isaiah had been divided into two kingdoms. Um, the northern kingdom was called Israel. Even, originally, that was the name of the whole country. But the northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern one was called Judah. But it kind of confuses us a little bit if you don't are not familiar with this stuff. In this chapter, the northern kingdom is called Israel, but it's also called Ephraim, which was the dominant tribe. There's, there's 10 tribes up here, and there's two tribes down here. And the dominant of the 10 tribes in the north was Ephraim. So the northern tribe was called Ephraim and Israel back and forth. And uh, <clears throat> they, they had all kinds of kings that, you know, they didn't have one dynasty. They, they'd get murdered and they'd start, a new king would take over and his, maybe his son would be king and then they'd get murdered and it was a whole new bloodline. But <clears throat> at the time here of, at the time of uh, this writing here in, in, in uh, Isaiah 7, Pekah, <laughs> Pekah was the, was the king of Israel. And there's another country right up here called Aram, A-R-A-M. That's kind of towards Turkey in that area. And then they, they mention... Another country that will eventually come along, <clears throat> and that's Assyria, and that's more like Iraq, okay? Um, so it's kind of complex. You know, I got so, I don't expect God to feed me baby food all my life. If I have to cut this steak up in tiny little pieces, I'm going to eat it. If I have to dig out the bones from catfish, I want the catfish. And so basically, this says that Isaiah, God told him, take your son, your son with you. Now, your son, the little boy he had that was already born, okay, his name was Shear. Must have been going to be a barber, right? Shear Jashub. <laughs> Laugh louder, Tara. So some, okay. 
Maybe he was going to be a barber. No, Shear Jacob. Jacob, it means a remnant shall return. And you're going, okay, this is what it's But God says, Isaiah, take your son, Shear Jacob, the barber, and go out to the washeteria, basically. He tells him where to go because when he gets there, the king is going to be there to meet him. It's, a, it's an aqueduct there, and it was a place where they washed clothes, and it was their washeteria. And God foreknows where the king Ahaz is going to be. Ahaz is supposed to be a good king, but he's not. He is one that's, that is, he rules over Judah. The capital's Jerusalem. They've got the temple. He is descended from David. Ahaz, A-H-A-Z, is descended from David. His son is Hezekiah, who was a good king, but Ahaz is not a good king. And he is worried because he, uh, he got a post, he got an internet message, he got some kind of word that Pekah in the north has allied with the king of Aram, and they're both going to come after him and conquer him and kill him and take over his kingdom and divide up all the stuff. And God, through Isaiah, tells Ahaz, don't worry, don't worry. This is not going to happen to you if you'll, if you'll trust me. Okay, get, get this. In verse 7, after he, you know, he, he talks about, Isaiah talks to Ahaz about the threats that he's heard. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is only Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. That's a man. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. He's saying that these countries are insignificant. Israel won't even be a country in 65 years. Ahaz is going, 65 years? I'm thinking about now. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's trying to tell him that in the mind of God, he's got this thing. The head of Ephraim is in is Samaria. That's the capital. And the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. And, then, and he's talking about these insignificant people. But he says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now, y'all, Isaiah, one other time, went to a king and says, you're having a hard time believing what I'm saying. Ask for a sign, any sign. And it was this guy's son. And he said, well, make the sun go back so that the shadow moves 10 steps backwards. And the light coming in through the window, hitting the staircase in the, his palace or whatever it was. And it, it happened to encourage the faith of his son. He said, ask me for a miracle, anything. And that happened. Okay. Isaiah says to Ahaz, verse 11, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. He quotes the scripture and tries to be more holy than God. He quotes what Moses had said in Deuteronomy where he told, warned the children of Israel, don't put the Lord your God to the test. It's not putting the Lord your God to the test when he, and he, God tells you through Isaiah of all people, the prophet, the man of God, and he says, ask me for a sign. I don't care what it is. You know, if you want the sun to go backwards, whatever. And he's going to be holy Really, he's copping out. He's being religious. He's quoting the scripture, but the devil quotes the scripture. And he says, I will not ask for the, I will not put the Lord, the God to the test. I will not ask for a You know, that said wrong is demonic. But Jesus quoted that when the devil told him to jump off of the temple. Does that make the angels catch him? He, he says, no, I will not put the Lord to the test. And he quoted Moses again but he was doing it in the right spirit because the devil was saying, get a sign to Jesus by jumping off and letting the angels catch you. And Isaiah was saying, no, God says ask for a sign. You see what I'm saying? You can say the same thing and it'd be sin or it being righteous, the red letters of Jesus. Okay, y'all get that? That's not even where we're going, but that's what's in this scripture right here. That's, the you know, I can, it's hard to skip over that. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. Then Isaiah, I think Isaiah's mad here. 
Isaiah said, hear now you house of David. See, this is a son of David, a great, 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 great grandson of David. Hear now you house of David. Is it enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, now here's Isaiah 7, 14, the famous verse. And I believe he gives this it's a real true word, but he's mad when he gives it. <laughs> he's got the zeal of the Lord on him. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. <clears throat> now, he, Jesus fills that verse full. But it's talking about an immediate prophecy. Okay, Jesus fulfilled it later, 700, 700 years. So, yeah, 700 years later. Okay, but the immediate fulfillment was that Mrs. Isaiah, he was, she's called the prophetess, is going to have a baby boy. His name, by the way, is going to be Meher Shalal Hashbaz, okay? And, and he's saying before he's this age, before he can say mama and daddy, already this and this is going to happen with these kings. This baby boy is going to be born, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, and y'all, and here's, this is my final point, sort of. Meher, the birth of Meher Shalal Hashbaz, he already had an older brother. That was Shear Jashub. They were standing there with Isaiah when he's prophesying. But his kid brother is Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And the, the name means, basically, which, which you'll see in your sub your sub notes your footnotes there is quick to the plunder quick to the spoil and i would like to translate that as first to get to the plunder first to the spoil if you're quick then you're gonna be the first one there okay so the albright uh, interpretation meher salal salal divide the plunder paul is going to divide the plunder who got the plunder first before Paul? Jesus. Right? Because Jesus is prophesied right here in Isaiah 53, 12, that after he's resurrected, he will divide the plunder with the strong. He's going to give the plunder. The plunder is the gospel of grace to the strong one, Paul. Okay, y'all with me? Uh, I hope. But this boy, it's a natural boy, and his life and what happens before he's, while well, he's still a baby, into these kingdoms, they're going to be destroyed. And it goes on and talks about, you know, the destruction of this place and destruction of this place and what you'll be eating and all this kind of stuff and this baby. And, and this baby is a sign that God is with you. That's the reason he, this baby is called Emmanuel. He's not God but he is a sign that God is with you, Ahaz. Try to believe God. Try to trust God. Because this baby boy is going to be born. I mean, you can't really tell, you know, that a year from now you're going to have a child and it's going to be a boy. But that's a pretty good sign when it, when it actually happens, okay? But y'all, if you see what I'm saying, a, a young woman, a virgin, shall conceive and bear a son. In a sense, it, well, Jesus fulfilled that. That's Christ, right? Well, this, in a sense, is a type of Jesus because he also fulfilled it. You see what I'm saying? This was the immediate fulfillment. Christ was the later fulfillment. 700 years later, according to Matthew, the, when Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus, it fulfilled Isaiah 7, 14, that a virgin shall conceive and, and have a child. This one was a natural birth. That was a supernatural birth. So in a, in a way... This is a picture, if you'll let me, of, of Christ. And you see why, why I'll get, do you get why I'm saying that? Because who was first to the plunder? Jesus, when he shed his blood and rose from the dead, he led captivity captive. That's what the scripture says. He led captivity captive. He brought, he paid for our sins so that the devil, by the power of the law, was putting us, was holding us hostage because the law said if you sin, you die. 
And so people who died, even if they died in faith, they couldn't go to heaven, they went to paradise. And that's another story. And maybe if we've got time, we'll come back to that. But they went to paradise. But what the scripture says, when Jesus ascended to heaven after the resurrection, he led captivity captive. He led those people who had been waiting in paradise ever since Abel died. They had been waiting there. Why? Because they still had, they only had goats and bulls blood to pay the interest on the debt. And until Jesus paid the debt with his blood, Hebrews says he ascended and carried his blood to the most holy place in heaven. And when he did that, Abel could walk in. Abel was able to walk in. And so was everybody else that had died and were waiting in paradise. Paradise was not heaven. They ascended with Christ. They, he went and preached to those, the, the, those spirits, the scripture says, in 1 Peter, while he, <clears throat> before he was resurrected, after he died, before he was resurrected. He was there declaring the full gospel to them. And when he ascended, but he was the first one to pay for, to obtain that these people can be saved by my blood. Salvation will be by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus obtained that, and the first person to really, really get it was Paul. He got it mouth to mouth, probably sitting in the desert of Damascus for two years listening to Jesus. Okay, that's some kind of postgraduate work. Okay, postgraduate to the max. Okay, but my point is, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, which is the most obscure person in the Old Testament, maybe one of the most obscure, and the strangest name, basically it means first to the plunder. Salal, Salal, Salal. Jacob said, in the evening he will divide the plunder. Isaiah says of the resurrected Christ, he will divide the plunder with the strong. Okay? Can plunder be taken from warriors? Who's the warriors? The devil had the right to accuse man until the blood of Jesus was shed. Even righteous men. <clears throat> only had the interest paid on the, on, the, on the deal. Jesus didn't say to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in heaven. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that day, and for three days there, they were in paradise. I may be telling you more than you can absorb at once, but... The word Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament is the same, same word. And, it, and, and we, unfortunately, it's been translated hell. But hell is a place of torment <clears throat> known as Gehenna. Jesus called it Gehenna, the burning place. But there was a place in the grave or in Sheol or in Hades where Abraham was. And when the poor man died, he went, Lazarus, the poor man Lazarus died. He went, it says, to the presence of Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, where Abraham was in paradise. But they could see across the great chasm to hell, where the rich man in torment lifted up his eyes and could see Abraham afar off and Lazarus resting in his bosom. And he says, Abraham, Abraham. Send Lazarus to dip his finger into a drop of water and cool my tongue. So they were in the, a divided place, the same place but different. You understand? But that place, the good side, emptied out. When Jesus ascended, he led captivity captive. He made an open show, according to Colossians, of the devil by triumphing over him by the blood of the cross. And the devil had carried out the crucifixion of Jesus. You talk about a victory when you get your enemy to defeat himself. 
And that is the mystery. Can captives be taken from warriors and plunder taken from the fierce? The fierce, the warriors, that's the devil that have a legal right because the word of God is the day you sin, you shall die. Well, they did die. But they didn't have to go to hell. All right. All right, so Mahershal Hashbaz was a picture of Christ. Why is it that he's got an older brother named a remnant shall return? Okay, Isaiah is, is you know, Jesus speaks of the end to the beginning very often. I, it's um, so amazing to me that it's 11-11, but in Isaiah 11-11, he talks about <clears throat> the Lord will reach out a sec and bring Israel back for us from a second, a second exile in Isaiah 11, 11. Let's just turn there. We're not far from there, about two pages. Okay, 11, 11. 11, 11. 11, 11, Isaiah. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria and from lower Egypt and upper Egypt and from Cush and Elam and Babylonia and Hamath and from the islands of the sea. In other words, he's, he's talking about Israel coming back to the land a second time before he talks about the first time. See, after this, they went off to Babylon and came back. But after that, at the time of the first century, when the temple of Herod is destroyed by the Romans, they go off and they're gone for 1,900 years until 1948, and they come back. And that's a prophecy of the second coming back before he talks about the first coming back. So Isaiah speaks of the end from the beginning sometimes. And y'all, the remnant that shall return will happen after Christ. That's you. And it will, in a way, it's about when they came back from Babylon, that's still in the future of Isaiah. When they come back from Babylon, it'll just be a remnant. There's only 5% that came back. And so, yeah, it is a prophecy. Isaiah is prophesying. See, Judah had not gone off yet into captivity. But when they did, a remnant would return. But I think this is really talking about us. Now, the church, a remnant, a remnant will return. The remnant is going to be what God's going to do the big deal with. It's always a remnant. It's always a minority. It's always the few. A few dedicated, always. But he speaks of this before he speaks of this guy who is a picture of Christ. He's not Christ. And this is not the remnant, but it's just a, a he's a, Isaiah's a prophet. He can't help it. He names everything prophetically. You think he's going to name his kids Tom, Dick, and Harry? You know, no. He's going to give them a name that means something. All right. T tonight, this has been the kind of stuff that if you're really, really, really into it, this priceless to you, but if you're not, this is going to, okay. But as far as I'm concerned, I make no apologies. As far as I'm concerned, this is the treasures for the Lord to say, guess what, Miles? Paul was not only the one who divided the plunder, he was a son of plunder. And I hadn't seen that before. Looked right at it, I hadn't seen it. And this Isaiah 49 had always been a mystery to me about can, God asking, can captives be rescued from warriors, and plunder taken from the fierce? And now there's that word Salal. And he's saying, yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. And he's talking about the Salal that will rescue the captives. And the Gentiles, when they hear it, are going to fall at their feet and lick the dust and say, hallelujah. Thank you for coming. Your feet are gorgeous. So, tonight, thank y'all for coming. Even though there's a national championship, friends show up on game day. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That might even be the Lord. All right. Before we officially close out here, in the room, any questions in the room? And I don't blame you a bit. Yes? Okay, so Isaiah um, 7, 14 talks about, you know, the virgin will give birth 
Yes. Share Joshua was already born. They were married, and he said, I'm going to have a baby. There's going to be a baby next year. That's not, okay, the word is Alma. And it's bigger than just a, a, a virgin maiden, okay? It's also a young woman. Okay. And so, uh, but the word in the New Testament couldn't be clearer. For some reason, there's, 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 a, there's a big, always been a furor about the virgin birth. For some reason, that's the first thing I want to reject is the virgin birth. But it could not be clearer in Matthew and Luke both that she would never, she had never been with a man. How can this be? She tells Gabriel, I've never been with a man. That's one place. But it, it's other places. But I'm saying, there's a saying that, especially, <clears throat> okay, Matthew says, and they came and lived at Nazareth, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, came and lived at Nazareth, and so was fulfilled the scripture that says he shall be called a Nazarene. Well, actually, it says he shall be called the branch. Okay, and this, the word is Nietzsche. And Nazareth is kind of related to that word for Nietzsche. Okay, so he's filling full the branch prophecy. And Isaiah, I mean, Matthew by the Holy Spirit puts that in there. But it's more than he fulfilled a great many things. See, by his stripes, we shall be healed. Okay, he fulfilled that. There's no, he, he just fulfilled that. But the others, he filled full. Okay, in other words, you have to kind of meditate on that, that there are some scriptures that were filled full by Christ. Others are very specific. I mean, Isaiah 69 says, I'm, I'm a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. And that's talking about his half brothers that were the sons of his mother, but not of his heavenly father. Another reference to his virgin birth. He fulfilled that, but he filled these others full. He fulfilled them in that he filled them full. And that's, that's not downplaying the awesomeness of Scripture. It's really building it up if you can let yourself not be afraid. For some reason, a lot of us are afraid that the Bible will find something the Bible's not true. You're not. You're not. That, that thing's perfect. If you'll be a real student and dig, you'll find the more you dig, the more you're going to find out that it is perfect. Really perfect. Perfect in a cool way. Perfect in a subtle way sometimes. Good stuff. Okay. Maybe getting close to halftime. Yes. Um, <laughs> which one? So, yeah, it's, it's, I, I spell it like this to not bring up confusion, but it's spelled S H, right? All right. Let me do this for me and I'll show you this. And you'll, you'll remember it better. Look at, look at, uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119, and look at verse 161. You got your most holy Bible? That's 721. <laughs> All right. Right there, verse 161. You see that verse? We well, see what's written right above it. Yeah, it's seen and sheen, and it's shaped like this. It's shaped like a W, and it's the S sound, and it's also the SH sound, depending on the application. G, think about this. Uh, G is the first letter of Jim, G-E-M, okay? But it's also the first letter of girl, like G-I-R-L, G and J. Which one is it? It's both. Depending on where you're using it, it's either G or J. And we have more than one letter that's like that. Depending on the context, it'll have a, this sound or that sound. And so the sheen has got a, 
you could you could you could say shalal or salal. Uh, but I just spelled it like that to keep from going off on that rabbit trail. But I'm happy to go off on that rabbit trail if somebody asks. But that's the answer. Is that it? It, it is in the NIV. It is spelled shalal with the S H. But it's the first letter is the sheen. Okay. Okay. I wasn't trying to pull anything. I was just trying to simplify. Uh, <clears throat> There's a place there at the time of Manasseh, not Manasseh, he's from the tribe of Manasseh, of uh, Jephthah. When they're at war and they, they grab the guys and they say, what's the name of this place? And the ones that said Sibboleth, they knew were the bad guys and they killed them, or Shibboleth. It's either one tribe said Sibboleth and one tribe said Shibboleth. And they knew the bad guys would pronounce it this way. Okay, so that's the Sheen thing. You know what I mean? Because you can pronounce it either way, but that's that's kind of the that's a good question. And it's, you know, like like uh, and sometimes in World War II movies you'll see uh, Germans wearing uh, Allied uniforms, and and they'll they'll mess up the word, and it's uh they'll pronounce it wrong, and, and they catch them. All right. Uh, great questions. Another other questions. I have to say you're paying attention to catch that spelling. <clears throat> I wasn't trying to deceive you, but I was trying to simplify. <laughs> okay, on uh, Zoom, any Zoomers have questions? By the way, <coughs> excuse me. In this, I, in uh, in Psalm uh, not one nineteen, he's got these twenty two sections, you know, and eight verses to a section, and every verse starts with the same letter. In other words, they, there's twenty two Hebrew letters, and the twenty first, the next, the last one is Sheen. And so that verse 161 through 168, that's, um, they all start with the letter, the sheen, but they may not all be pronounced sh or su. Um, okay, any Zoomers out there? <clears throat> uh, let, let me, I don't know. Three, three Zoomers is awesome on, on tonight. Hey, back to your question. Uh, Isaiah 8, which obviously comes after Isaiah 7. Let me read this, uh, verse 1. The Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen. Meher Shalal Hashbaz. Okay, he's writing the name of the boy before he's conceived. And I'll see, I will call Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberkiah as reliable witnesses for me. Then I went to the prophetess, that's his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, name him Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And before the boy knows how to say, my father and my mother are M or Ab. That's the way they said uh, mom and dad. The wealth of Damascus and the, and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off. And it's the law. But my point is, is that he was born by a natural couple. Okay. That was Mrs. Isaiah, and they already had a boy. And even if they hadn't, I mean, he's saying specifically, this was a natural conception. And it's Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And he's the one that's being prophesied in chapter 7. In the immediate but the Holy Spirit, I don't think Isaiah probably knew what he was prophesying. Where, where in the New Testament does it say that these Old Testament guys very often were prophesying Christ and they didn't get it? <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1. Okay, it's, it's halftime, I understand. I'm going to go on forever. 
I promise it. I need two cases of powdered milk. Okay, verse 10, 1 Peter, y'all just listen to me. I won't, you don't have to look it up. 1 Peter 1, 10, considering, uh, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. Jesus was talking to them when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. But through who? Isaiah and David, but others. But he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. They were going to die before this actually happened. But for you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. And what it said is, is that the, the prophets were prophesying this about the virgin birth and the other thing, the sufferings of Christ. And they were going, what is this about? What is this about? And they didn't know. But they do now. And when Jesus, after he died, before he resurrected, went down there and told them. That's right. That's right. Maybe it was like a... <laughs> I told you at the beginning about the pastor a couple of years ago. I walked into church on Sunday morning wearing this coat, and he says, ah, these prophetic people. I said, what? He said, I'm preaching on John the Baptist today, and you walk in here wearing camel hair coat. So, I mean, I certainly didn't know that one. Okay, <laughs> okay, pretty cool. All right, anything else? Lord, we love you, we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you, and I personally give you thanks. As you know where I was before we started and how much I needed you. Thank you for showing up again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.